So welcome to all of you to this opening presentation for this year's uh, Sunday at the Abbey uh, series. This year uh, is the 150th anniversary of the, the, those pioneer monks actually coming up this way to land on this site. So this year's series is really devoted both to those origins and then also to the evolution of, of this kind of place, uh, the physical site uh, that, that we're on. Sometimes when we're looking at the history of a place or in a place for a while, it can seem like it's just a straight shot. That is, is how else would it, be, it evolved, huh? It's a, it's a slam dunk. Well, if you read the early chapters of Coleman Berry's Worship and Work and other sources, you realize not by a long shot, not at all. There were false starts, disagreements, um, just a lot of questions. And, and so it's comforting to us in our own situation as we try to navigate uh, in our own lives. It's truly my pleasure and honor to introduce to you Miss Peggy Roski, uh, our this evening's presenter and our lead off presenter for this series. She grew up in St. Cloud, Minnesota as Peggy Landwehr. Um, she uh, went to local schools in St. Cloud and then made her way west to St. Ben's High School, uh, starting in 1969 and graduating in 73. And she was a member of the last class and the valedictorian of that last class to graduate from St. Ben's High School. She then matriculated at St. Ben's with majors in English and Humanities took classes from individuals we love and know well, uh, Father Alfred Deutsch, Father Hillary, Sister Emmanuel Renner, Sister Carol Berg, Father Alexander Andrews, and a host of others. She and Michael married in 1980, um, and then went to Wisconsin where uh, he worked for the Turner Winfield Design Woodshop to pay the rent while well, Peggy got her master's degree in library and information science at the uh, U of W in 1982. She returned, and so did Michael, to St. John's at that point, and as a reference and instruction librarian, and maintained her own institutional archive uh, on the shelves of her office. She loves to do that kind of historical digging in terms of tracking down key information. In 2006, she became the uh, joint CSB-SJU archivist, and this year she moved not once, but twice for this renovation. My goodness. When Father Vincent Tegeter was no longer able to give his historical accounts to the administrative assembly, Peg stepped right up to the task, and her monthly five-minute history lessons at the SJU Administrative Assembly luncheon meetings are, many say, the main reason why they come, which is high praise, high praise. The title of her presentation this evening is Faith, Civilization, and Education, Establishing a Benedictine Culture on the Frontier. Please give Peg Roski a warm Collegeville welcome. Thank you, Abhichar. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, I, I was trying to think of an opening joke, and the only thing that came to mind was something from my early days of doing instruction in the library where I read, and I don't think I ever used this in a class, but something about studies show that people fear snakes, and they fear dark rooms, but they fear public speaking most of all. So a lot of people would rather be in a dark room full of snakes. <laughs> and up here speaking to you. <laughs> I also have some considerable misgivings about speaking to this particular audience about this particular subject because for the monks in the crowd, it's your history, not mine. <laughs> and so it's with uh, some trepidation that I uh, speak to the choir, <laughs> so to speak. Um, 
I also have not committed worship and work to memory. It's, it's Bible size. In fact, I, I've debated about bringing it along just to wave it at you like I can wave this one by Alexius Hoffman, which you can see is the first 50 years, so it's not so big. Uh, but worship and work was, <laughs> like I said, too thick to carry, and it's the Bible of St. John's history. Not without its flaws, a couple of which I might point out to you tonight, but a, a wonderful resource. Um, as is Alexius Hoffman's many, many documents. Um, and I want to thank Brother David Klingeman in the Abbey Archives, especially for uh, making some of that material available to me. And also, across the years, I've been able to digitize a lot of resources and make them available. So they're available to you, too, not just to me, um, and searchable, which is really wonderful on the, on the website. Um, specifically, I thank Father Hillary for being a go-to person where is he now? There. Um, when I have questions I can't quite answer or something I can't quite remember, and I know Hillary or maybe Wilfred will remember something long enough ago, so I, I tap them once in a while. Um, and if anybody wants to know more about the history of the Benedictine women, I highly recommend Sister Ephraim's book about the Benedictine, the establishment of women Benedictines in this country. Um, and there are other print sources I'll mention in just a minute. Um, what can I offer on top of all of that? Well, I got some images that some of which I haven't seen until I found them, um, and hopefully they'll be interesting to you. Um, the information about places around here, and I really bring my own curiosity to the to the topic. So sometimes I hope you'll find this stuff as interesting as I find it, <laughs> because it makes me pursue more information. Um, I'll stick mostly to the earliest years and mostly to St. John's, as opposed to St. John's and St. Ben's. Um, I am assuming a lot of you here haven't given the topic like this too much study, aside from the novices maybe having to read Worship and Work, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> when they first come on board. Um, and they do hand out copies of it to new employees at the St. Ben's Administrative Assemblies, but how many of them actually sit down and read the thing is another story. Um, I also want to emphasize, um, and this will come up in a few points, but probably not enough points, um, that the Benedictines were motivi motivated by their faith and the desire to civilize things and to educate. That Those three things were so important, and they come up again and again in Benedictine history. Their, their philanthrop philanthropy for doing those things for the rest of us um, is without question. Um, the sense of place, one of the, one of the uh, vows that the ben Benedictines make is also important in this context because it's the place that matters in some ways, and that's what made it really interesting for me to investigate some of this. So uh, be forewarned, I do tend to talk fast. I'll try not to talk too fast. I've only got about 100 in slides to go, 100, 100 or so slides to show you. But I, I would like to get through them all. But um, do interrupt me if you have questions. Otherwise, there will be time for questions at the end if I talk fast enough. <laughs> OK, without further ado, um, I do want to mention the sources that are available on the websites. If you go to the St. Ben St. John's website, um, you will see a page like this. Um, that you can go to if you if you go to the A to Z list and go to the A page for archives, then you can click on archives for St. John's, and then when you're there, you can click on history and you can find your way to the listing of the online sources that are books, and they do include. It's hard to see that image there. Um, the book that I brought with me, Alexius Hoffman's book on the first 50 years just called St. John's University, 1857 to 1907. And then, of course, Worship and Work. And Father Hillary's edited book, St. John's at 150, that came out a bunch of years ago when we were celebrating the sesquicentennial. Similarly, for St. Ben's, you can find resources on the website, books and media about them. And there are also some sources that are about the cooperation between the two that I've also had digitized and put online. With Lamps Burning is the sisters' history up through their first centen their centennial in 1957. It talks a little bit about the college, but it turned out to not be the real history of the college as much as I would have liked as the archivist when people ask me questions. 
luckily, um, uh, and there's also this um, threads from our tapestry that talks about the ministries and the other, um, other houses and other missions that the sisters uh, went to from St. Ben's. And then Annette Atkins' book on, for the centennial of St. Ben's Challenging Women since 1913 became the history book for the St. Ben's College that I was hoping to have. Um, so those things are all online on the website, with the exception of Father Hillary's book. I'm working on him to give me, let me put that up online. I do have the text, but it's still for sale in the bookstore, so go buy one if you haven't already. Um, another resource that a lot of you may not even know about is Minnesota Digital Libraries, which collects um, digital resources from across the state and makes them available on their website, Minnesota Reflections. So there is a collection in there from St. Ben's Monastery and the Abbey. Um, and Stern's History Museum, so you can go there and there's a very, very, very long list of contributors of so local historical societies and that sort of thing. So there's lots of resources online that you, you can go to and search separately or collectively to see what's been digitized that has to do with the history of the state of Minnesota. Stern's History Museum is also a good resource if you want to do some research into local, um, local information. Okay. One of the first things I discovered is this article that's in a booklet form in the archives published by August Cray, who's a professor of history, went on to chair the history department at the U of M. Monte Cassino, Metten, and Minnesota um, laid out the early history of the Benedictines finding their way here to Minnesota. And so I'm going to draw upon some of that as I proceed through here. So going way back to the beginning, not to Benedict's Cave exactly, not that far back, but to Monte Cassino in Italy, up on the hill, uh, where Benedict's first monastery was built. Then the next stop on the history was uh, Metten in Germany, which is the monastery from whence our monks came to St. John's. And just for the heck of it, this is what Monte Cassino looks like now similar perspective. Didn't find a nice picture like that for Metten, but I did a little Google Earth and came up with this image of Metten more recently. And then, of course, St. John's in the modern era. OK, so Bavaria, Bayern in Germany, is where Metten was. And also, like, uh, Munich, that gives you the perspective of where Munich is. So it's about an mm, uh, hour and a half. Do you remember when you drove um, from Munich? And Eichstadt is not too far away either, where the sisters came from. Back to Monte Cassino, Metten, and Minnesota, with a couple of quotes. So the Benedictine monasteries realized the ideals of service which their founder had set before them. From the monastic center, the monks went out to convert the heathen and to minister to those that were already converted. The people among whom they worked were not yet civilized, and the life they led was a, still a semi-raving one, in his words. The monks had to teach these people not only the fundamentals of the Christian religion, but also the fundamentals of civilized life. At the monastic center, the monks taught the youth letters and taught them, both them and the adults, agriculture, history, and in general, the arts of civilization. The monastic clusters of buildings which the monks themselves literally built gradually became the nuclei of permanent villages and towns. In fact, some of the cities of Germany today owe their origin to these early monasteries. Um, Located on the border of Bohemia, met and served the region as a typical Bavarian institution. I like this line. It's known for its properties, its learning, art, illuminated manuscripts, and its influential position in ecclesiastical affairs. So, kind of a little bit like the Abbey now, <laughs> following in its footsteps. Metten survived the Protestant revolt, but became a victim of the secularization laws which followed in the wake of Napoleon's conquests. When, in which all the spiritual princi principalities and ecclesiastical possessions were confiscated in the Bavarian secularization decrees in 1802 and 1803. So they really closed the monasteries all over, all over Napoleon's conquested areas in Europe. Metten was suppressed, its possessions were secularized, and its 23 monks were scattered. So it was basically the end of Metten's 1,000 years of existence. Um, 
By 1814, scarcely 30 Benedictine monasteries remained as remnants of the armies of monks which once Christianized and civilized Europe. Uh, liberals and advanced prophets of scientific progress had relegated monasticism to medieval times as out of harmony with the ideals of the 19th century, something that might be said by some today about the ideals of the 21st century. But upon the death of uh, Maximilian in, in Bavaria in 1825, his son succeeded to the throne as Ludwig I. And Ludwig I opposed his dad's support for Napoleon, who closed the monasteries. He reopened the Catholic monasteries, including Metten. He supported the church's mission efforts in America. And as a point of trivia, his 1880, 1810 wedding was the first Oktoberfest in Munich. <laughs> he dreamed of creating a union of political liberalism and traditional Catholicism, which is a line we might use in our election today. <laughs> so here's King Ludwig, Ludwig and he fa financed Boniface Wimmer, not to be confused with Ludwig II, who's the other picture here, who's the one people think of when you think of King Ludwig of Bavaria because he did Cinderella's castle that Disney monopoly <laughs> took advantage of. So it's not, not, not the one with the castle, uh, but King Ludwig I. Okay, on to Boniface Wimmer, who founded the Benedictine Order in the US. Boniface, like his sainted namesake, sought to foster Christianity and Benedictinism to the unchurched of his day. His first stop was to minister to the German immigrants in Pennsylvania. So Wimmer and his monks settled first in St. Vincent's Parish in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And it was pretty humble beginnings when they found only a small schoolhouse, a barn, a log cabin, and a small brick church. It was already established as a parish, but the local bishop sort of asked them to take it on. Um, it was the first Benedictine monastery in the U.S., and humble beginnings uh, was really appropriate to say because this was their first building in, uh, in La Trobe. Here's a more pleasant drawing from later of St. Vincent's. Um, Boniface recruited more Benedictines from his Bavarian homeland, men and women, to come to teach the German immigrants in Pennsylvania. St. Vincent's, after five years, was... Uh, had, been, had been established five years, and they had 100 monks already. And there's that, in this drawing, there's that original building that, that, they, that I was able to find a picture of. So they had 100 monks after five years. Within nine years, there were 200, and it became an abbey with Boniface Wimmer as its abbot. And here's a later picture as well. So... Wimmer established other communities as well in North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama. It's kind of a mystery. I, I would have to read more to learn about his travels all over those places. Louisiana, Illinois, and Colorado. So he was setting up monasteries all over the place. In 1887, he became the arch abbot. And he died in 1887. And these images on the sides are from his grave site in, uh, in La Trobe, where Michael and I were able to visit a couple summers ago. Um, so Boniface Wimmer had a bunch of firsts, and there's a good book about him that I've pictured here. Um, among them, he established the first Benedictine monastery in North America. He created the first modern Benedictine monastery whose monks were predominantly lay brothers, upon whom the prosperity of the community of St. Vincent um, depended. So it was important to have the lay brothers to support the efforts of the abbey. Um, he was, became the first irremovable pastor in the U.S. Um, he convinced the Bishop of Pittsburgh to name him that, that um, and granting him and his successors perpetual rights to the parish at St. Vincent. I don't know if you guys have perpetual rights to the parish at St. John's. <laughs> Um, though Wimmer was named after St. Boniface, if you do a lot of reading about it, especially if you're interested in the history of the Benedictines in St. Joseph, um, you know that he wasn't a saint. <laughs> um, he, uh, 
Accounts show how he tried to assert control over those first Benedictine sisters, and were they under the bishop or were they under the, mon the Boniface? Um, and he made demands that include, included that they had to dismiss their superior and that the prior was to provide no spiritual services to those first four sisters until he was assured that they recognized his authority. So anyway, on to Minnesota from St. Vincent's. And f to talk about Minnesota and the German immigrants, we have to talk about Father Francis Piers, after whom the city of Piers is named. I want to read more about him because it just astounds me how he was able to establish missions and parishes and um, do as much as he did. Of course, he lived to be 95, um, which is amazing. And, and he was already in his 70s when the monks showed up here. So it was incredible. But he, um, and here's, here's a couple other pictures of him. I like the, the full picture that shows his worn out shoes <laughs> because he walked and walked and walked a lot. They, they hardly ever mentioned any of these monks riding horses to get around. They were walking all the time. It's amazing. Anyway, um, he attracted Germans, German Catholics to Minnesota, Slovenian, which is what he was, and Germans to come here by with these glowing descriptions of the land and the weather. Um, quote, winter is some, somewhat longer, but not more severe than in the southern states. <laughs> really? Um, in the three years I have been here, I have not seen more than one foot of snow. And during winter, I see German settlers working out in their shirt sleeves. Define winter. Um, and he said, I wish that the choicest pieces of land become the property of thrifty Catholics. But to prove yourselves good Catholics, do not bring any free thinkers, red Republicans, atheists, or agitators. <laughs> anyway, um, Pierce um, was asked by the local bishop, Bishop Creighton, um, how to get some priests here to minister to the Catholics. And so Bishop Creighton was advised by Father Piers that he should write to Ludwig's Missionsverein back in Mvaria, which is where the monks came from, to ask for monks. And when he did that, they, were, they referred him to Boniface Wimmer because he was already over here and had established a monastery. So it was a roundabout way of getting a request through to um, Boniface Wimmer right here in Minnesota to provide some, some uh, priests. He was also, Wimmer was also asked by some other places to provide priests, and he wasn't sure who to give them to, so to speak. So he just decided whoever got back to him first would be the ones that get him. And Bishop Creighton happened to be the one whose letter arrived first. So that's how you guys wound up in Minnesota instead of someplace else. Kind of incredible. So five monks came west. And Minnesota, back in those days, of course, you'll learn more about this from Annette's talk next time. She'll give more of this background. But there weren't very many roads. It was mostly river traffic. And so here's a picture, not of the monks' riverboat, but a, a picture from With Lamps Burning of the riverboat that brought the sisters to St. Cloud. The monks um, grabbed a riverboat in Erie, Pennsylvania, as did the sisters, rode it all the way down the Ohio River to St. Louis, and they get off that boat and get on one going north. So the monks rode from St. Louis to St. Paul in something in a boat called the Minnesota Bell, and then the H.M. Rice brought him up to St. Cloud. So now we're getting closer. Here's a drawing of the St. Cloud Priory on the banks of the Mississippi, drawn by one of the first students of St. John's. There were five students in the first class, and Henry Emmel was one of them. Um, he was the son of Joseph Emmel, who was a carpenter and church painter. And um, Henry actually later served in the Minnesota legislature. So the beginnings of St. John's in St. Cloud, this is an account by Bruno Riss, or Ries, one of the first five monks, um, who's written a lot too, not as much as Alexius Hoffman, but uh, some valuable accounts. So he talks about the, the house that they built that was erected in the spring, the priests and the lay brothers, assisted by Mr. Lodemeyer. My mom was a Lodemeyer, so I think this was my great-great-great-grandfather, perhaps? Anyway, um, they did the carpenter work, a little family background there. Um, Father Bruno had brought tools from St. Vincent's. We had to hustle to finish all the doors so that we could keep the wintry blasts out of the house. 
So the chapel, 12 foot by 12 foot, was finished and dedicated, dedicated on the Feast of St. John the Baptist, and they decided that because Benedict himself had dedicated the chapel in Monte Cassino to St. John the Baptist, that they would do likewise. So that's why we're called St. John the Baptist here in Collegeville, not St. Benedict's. Um, and Father Bruno <laughs> noted, as tidings of salvation were first preached from the banks of the Jordan, now they were spread to the west from the banks of the Mississippi. Okay, here's Stearns County, and there's this wonderful book about the churches of Stearns County that came out recently, Legacies of Faith. It pictures them all and gives some of their history. I'd recommend it for anybody who's interested in that sort of thing. But of course, the towns were gradually settled, and there's not much in the way of roads. But when you, whoops, skipping a point here. When you, when you started to look at the list of parishes that um, the prior was sending his priests out to minister in, so you had St. Cloud, St. Joseph, St. Augustus, St. James in Jacob's Prairie, St. Stephen, St. Wendell. You can see why they call it the Tour of Saints bike ride, because <laughs> it's all saints all over the place. A few others, like Cold Spring and Richmond, thrown in for good measure. But So the monks were based in St. Cloud, but they were going out to all these parishes to minister to the people, sometimes staying there, sometimes not, sometimes going back and forth. So again, it's incredible the amount of mileage they put on their boots. So on to Father Cornelius Whitman, who opened the first school, not St. John's School. This is a confusing point for me. He opened this school... Um, um, the first school within the present boundaries of Stearns County after Mass on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, in, i.e. December 8th of 1856. So there, he started the first school, but this wasn't the school for St. John's yet. It was a parish elementary school, which at the time inaugurated free public education in central Minnesota. So the first school, not St. John's yet, but the first school that Cornelius started, was in a small frame building that was owned by Joseph Edelbrock, a name that might sound familiar for anybody who knows, knows about Edelbrock House here on campus, which no longer exists because they tore it down last year. Um, but anyway, he, Joseph, cheerfully donated the use of one of the rooms. It was a free school. No tuition was asked. The teacher received no pay. Um, but um, besides donating the use of his house, one might say, tongue-in-cheek, that they also donated their son. <laughs> because their son, Anthony um, Edelbrock, later became Abbot Alexius Edelbrock, OSB. And there's an interesting story there, too, because um, Anthony uh, was the f first, first young man that the monks encountered because he ran the ferry that they took across the river when they first came on the riverboat. Um, and so they said, hey, we're going to have this school. You should come and get educated. So after two years of study and association with the fathers, he was convinced that God was calling him to a life according to the rule. And he told his father about his plans, and his father wouldn't have anything to do with it. He needed him to help run his hotel. He had a lot of enterprises. So late in the night of July 2nd, 1859, Anthony quietly left, snuck out of his father's house in, in St. Joe, which is where they were living at the time, trudged the nine miles down to the priory below St. Cloud, and in the morning, his father uh, lost no time in setting forth in hot pursuit. And uh, when he heard that his father was coming after him, Anthony hid in some friend's house and uh, in the vicinity and escaped his father's detection. So uh, a few days later, with only a dollar fifty in his pocket, he boarded a river steamboat that ran down to Anthony St. Anthony Falls. He then walked to St. Paul, and. Uh, spoke to Prior Demetrius, who was at Assumption Church then, and asked for further direction. He earned his way to St. Louis as a steamboat hand, saved his earnings from odd jobs in St. Louis, and eventually, with the aid of benefactors, was able to pay his fare to go to St. Vincent's. Quite the story. So back to the Priory on the Mississippi and this sketch by Henry Emmel. The Priory was near the present-day children's home, um, a while back, Father Hillary and some others did a little scouting there, and now there's a historical marker on the site. You may have seen if you've walked the Beaver Island Trail. Um, this bottom picture is a mystery. 
it didn't used to be a mystery to me. I just took it at face value because worship and work says it's on it's on page 38, the pictures section. It was 1907, the ruins of the priory in St. Cloud. Okay. Um, oh, back a minute. Um, so this was the Rothkopf claim that it's also known as. And that's, be let me tell you a little bit about the Rothkopfs. We don't have any photos of them, at least I don't know of any. You don't, yeah, David's shaking his head. We don't have photos of them. But they were, um, they came to Minnesota in 1854, Wilhelm and Ludwig, or William and Louis. Um, they claimed 260-acre homesteads south of the city of St. Cloud on the riverbank. They were bachelor farmers, um, rather advanced in age, poor and already and already getting, getting up there. Um, they wanted to transfer their claim to the Benedictine fathers in exchange for the fathers and the community taking care of them in their old age. You know, they had no family back in Germany somewhere. Um, William, the older brother, died in 1859, so he didn't stick around for very long. Um, Louis, quote, was half-witted and remained in charge of the monks until his death in 1890. In fact, his grave is in the cemetery. I went and looked. It's in row five, space 10, if anybody wants to go look. So he's, he's buried here. Um, so their claim, here's a, a excuse me, a hand-drawn map by Glanville Smith that actually shows up in Lith Lamps Burning because it talks to the point of where the sisters first landed when they were in St. Cloud. So this hand-drawn map, if you overlay it with today's Google map of St. Cloud, you see that the features are pretty accurate. Taking it away again and putting it enlarged here. And then I put this side by side with a map that I got from Brother David in the um, Abbey archives that shows the Rothkopf claim. So it's got Lowry's Ferry, which is up by Sauk Rapids, the Wilson's Ferry, which was near where Wilson Park is now in St. Cloud, um, closer to downtown. The western edge of it was about where that low spot is by the cathedral's football practice field outside the Cathedral High School. So that's where it landed. Um, here's where their claim was. And so if we enlarge that, you'll see handwritten on there. It's hard to make out, but it says William Rothkopf, Louis Rothkopf, and Benno Muckenthaler, which who was one of the initial monks too, so he got one of these claims as well. It was in section 24 of the St. Cloud Township. Okay, now if we look at current times, you can see where it lands. You can see those red lines. Let me show you that again. I love doing this sort of thing. So, oh, cool. That's where it is. Um, and and um, if you can see where Clearwater Road is there on the red line on the west edge, I grew up on Clearwater Road, right about where the A of clear is, <laughs> was uh, my dad's house, my, my parents' house, um, still in the family. That's cool. So here's a little section of it. And I've got a close-up of that, and this is like the parking lot for St. Cloud State's hockey, hockey Center now, if you're familiar with the area at all, and the Beaver Island Trail runs along the river there. Okay, this map, also from the Abbey Archives, shows what is now, I believe, 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th Street of St. Cloud, but the monks were going to sell these lots to make some money so they could you know, build up their, their uh, school and monastery. And so they plotted out this land. And they called it Boniface Street, College Street, St. Louis Street, and Bavaria Street. And so they were ready to go. Turned out um, they didn't have rights to the claim. The Rothkopfs actually did not have all their paperwork in the right way. So. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that later. But so here we're back at the claim. Now, this was another thing I got from Brother David more recently, which I had never thought of, or seen, or heard of before until recently. This is a drawing, and there's writing underneath it that you can't really read. Maybe you guys in the front row can read it, but to translate it for you, it says, St. John's College near St. Cloud, print from woodcut made by H. Emil student of said college. So here we are again with another image from the same student showing a much different building than the other sketch that gets circulated so much. And this is supposed to be from 1856 to 1866. This is what St. John's College looked like there on the banks of the Mississippi. 
hmm, well, this was a revelation to me. Underneath this woodcut, in the same document, this print of the woodcut, um, this handwriting from Alexius Hoffman, which I won't expect you to read, but the start of it says, the above is a sketch from memory of old St. John's, which is what they called St. John's when it was still in St. Cloud, on the banks of the Mississippi, two miles below downtown. It shows the buildings frame as they were between 1862 and 1866. He says, I believe A was the college, B was the monastery, and C was the chapel. So, whoa, this is cool. Um, and this shows up in worship and work, this bit here. It says, um, if there was any temptation to return, this was after they had moved on, if there was any temptation to return to the riverbank, it was cut off in 1866 when the group of five original buildings then occupied by an organ building were just totally destroyed by an early morning fire. So five buildings were burned down. So it was like, oh, okay, it was more than just that little sketch by Henry Emmel. This is his second work of art that shows a much larger complex um, on the banks of St. Cloud, uh, Mississippi River. So we've had them, you know, wherever, whatever it was, whatever it looked like, it burned down um, and not a trace remains. You can see in this bottom picture, it does show the Mississippi River. It just doesn't look like the five-story or the, the five-part, two-story building. Maybe this was just one of the outbuildings that was purported in Worship and Work to be a photo of the first priory. And here's the historical marker on the banks, and you can see the children's home back behind it. Um, uh, the students spoke of Old St. John's. Um, it was known primarily as a seminary, but it was uh, open to other students as well, so to um, fit students for the secular life. So teachers, farmers, professionals, and businessmen were found among the alumni of early St. John's. Okay, so the seminary opened on the Rothkopf claims on 10th of November, 1857. And so that's the date that the prep school actually honors every year as the beginning of their existence. So they have now have, uh, I think they call it Legacy Week, that week of November every year. It just started that last year. So the beginnings could scarcely have been more humble, as they say. The first students, all five of them, <laughs> were all from the region. There was no publicity or formal announcement of the school opening. It said, the, the five young men merely moved in with the monks as students had done in centuries past in hundreds of monasteries. The curriculum was that of liberal arts Latin school with instruction in history, English, German, Latin, Greek, astronomy, rhetoric, and math. None of the students could have been aware that they had by this act become members of Western civilization's oldest educational family. A little bit about what life was like in those early days. They had to get up at 5 a.m., say morning prayers, go to daily mass, study until 7 o'clock breakfast, which consisted of a cup of coffee, if such it could be called, and dry bread, no butter, molasses, or sugar. And after breakfast, they were free for half an hour. Woo. Uh, <laughs> after breakfast, um, then they had classes from 8 to 11, then dinner, which was described as a watery black soup with plenty of bread, and potatoes and meat, never more than one kind, then bread, and our drink was water. It was a while before they got around to brewing beer. <laughs> um, after dinner, they had free time until 1 o'clock, and then classes resumed. At 3 o'clock, they got another piece of dry bread with water, relished with gusto. Um, four, from 4 to 6, they had to study. At 6 o'clock, they had supper. Again, soup was the first dish. From 7 to 8.30, study time, then night prayers, and to bed. So apparently the students at least didn't get up in the middle of the night for prayers. I assume the monks were doing that, but I don't know that for sure. And then after night prayer, silence reigned, no talking, whatever was allowed. Okay, Bruno Riss, the aforementioned, he was on the hunt for a different site for the monks. He was never convinced that the site in St. Cloud was going to be something that would be sustainable for them. It wasn't suitable for a monastery because, as he said, it lacked both wood and pasture land. There's this wonderful Sagatagan saga story by Cloud, Father Cloud 
Meinberg that was uh, published in Scriptorium, another publication that I had digitized when I came on board because I hadn't heard of it before and it was so wonderful. It tells all these historical stories about the monks. So the, the monastery, the abbey used to publish this. Don't anymore, um, but it's all online. Not always terribly searchable. The text is supposed to be searchable, but when you're digitizing something like that, you can see how the computer might not always pick out all the letters. So uh, it is readable to the human eye, but not always uh, understandable to the computer. But it's still a wonderful resource that uh, I've used many times. So um, the Sagatagan Saga um, has Bruno talking about the beginnings and how he didn't think we had enough in St. Cloud and he was scouting out for something else. He was stationed um, responsible for ministering to the people in St. Joseph. So he thought the monastery should be near St. Joe along the Watab River um, where there was some newly surveyed acreage. So um, um, the, the Rothkopf claim didn't, didn't cut it for him. So he was looking for pasture land, trees, and water, a good place for those things. So Bruno, who by the way is immortalized now on the virtual tour for St. Ben's and St. John's, which has a little gnome-like figure called Bruno <laughs> that gives you a little virtual tour of campus on your computer. Um, check it out if you haven't seen that yet. Um, so Bruno set out to find a better place, and um, in, in among his uh, saga here, he talks about the township divisions being marked by notches into the trees, and he could only go one day a week. The, the prior let him go on Mondays to check out the land and see what he could find. So he would walk all the way out from St. Cloud on Mondays, do what scouting he could, and then walk back. I mean, the thought of doing one of those trips in a day is, you know, incredible to me. Um, but they would, they they decided to set up some claim shacks, if you will, out there. So they cut timber and uh, got some tamaracks for small huts. And he has a story about getting a shack going, and then it snowed, and they had didn't have shingles or boards, so they had to make one side bigger and kind of have a lean-to with. Tamarack to uh, serve as the ceiling, and they went to, back to St. Joe the first day and came back the next day and brought a small stove and a door, a board to serve as a door, and lugged all this stuff on their shoulders. They didn't have horses and there weren't any roads, but they did that in two days to, to lay the foundation of the future abbey by establishing a claim shack. So it's to his foresight and shrewdness that St. John's, John's owns its owes its permanent location. So he's the first one who saw the possibilities of what was called Indian Bush, this vicinity out here. And he uh, requested permission to obtain it and directed the work of erecting these claim shacks so that each one would be assigned to a particular monk and they could claim a big area by having these shacks supposedly personed by uh, various monks. Um, I, I don't think I have it on the screen here. Yeah. Um, so uh, these are the, the claims. Um, but he had, in this saga, he talks about, how are we going to pay for this? We didn't have any money. And we, um, the, the grasshopper plague was in full force in the area right then. So the people living here, much as they appreciated the ministrations of the monks, didn't have any wherewithal to support the monks. They were on their own. Um, he's, he, Bruno says, in later years, I was frequently reproached for not claiming more land west of the lake. You know, across Stump Lake, it's like, that's Ike land. <laughs> you can't go all the way around the lake without trespassing. Um, he says, nowadays, the eggs are always m smarter than the hen. <laughs> so, but, um, and here's some early machinations. He, um, he put up signs. They didn't have enough monks to claim enough of the land that they wanted to claim to have fuel and trees and pasture and water. Um, so they put up signs in different parts that they were intending to claim and said, um, application for this land has been made to Congress for St. John's College. And then they contacted a contact they had back in, in D.C. to um, try to put that through. It actually failed, but because of the signs, the land sharks stayed away. Um, Annette will probably give you more about this next time too, but the, the Abbey does have copies of the 
military bounty land warrants that were used to buy the tracts of land that had been assigned to the veterans of the War of 1812 or something. I, I should know more about that, but we'll leave it at that for now. So back to St. Cloud. Um, the litigation over the Rothkopf land made things uncertain, so Father Cornelius decided to transfer everybody out to St. Joe, eight miles west of St. Cloud, where, he, where Bruno provided room for the professor and the students. So they trucked everything out to St. Cloud in 1858, or to St. Joe in 1858. And this is a drawing, actually, of the sisters' first convent in St. Joe, but the monks were there as well, I'm not sure what building. Um, Prior Benedict Handel considered the transfer made by Cornelius ill-advised, and so he moved the college back to St. Cloud. So for the next three years, it was in St. Cloud um, until the Indian uprising, when the, everything sort of stopped operations for a while. Then the next prior, Father Othmar, um, didn't see any future for the monastery of the college near St. Cloud, so he was in agreement with Bruno. So he resolved to move farther out into the county, out, out into Indian Bush. So he had the charter amended. That's a whole other history lesson uh, you can find on the website. Um, he had the charter amended, so it didn't say that they had to be in St. Cloud. They could just be in Stearns County. So um, some lands were taken up, you know, had been taken up in Indian Bush. And so Prior Othmar built a monastery and a college in Indian Bush. The buildings of which not a trace remains stood in the field about half a mile west of what is now Collegeville Station on the Great Northern Railroad. They were solid log structures two stories high, and the college resumed its activity with a small class of students. So they went from St. Cloud to St. Joe, St. Joe to St. Cloud, St. Cloud to Indian Bush, back and forth, back and forth. So the chronology, 170 years ago, they left Germany and went to St. Vincent's. 160 years ago, they left St. Vincent's and came to St. Cloud and then moved to the Indian Bush in 64. And 150 years ago this year, they moved here. So that's what Abbot John was talking about. It was 150 years ago when they moved here on the banks of Lake St. Louis, AKA Lake Sagatagan. So that's the basic chronology. St. John's in the Indian Bush. Here's another drawing, courtesy of Alexius Hoffman and Brother David in the Abbey Archives, um, where he drew the structures that were part of, the, were the St. John's um, Abbey and school in Indian Bush, somewhere down in Lower Collegeville, where uh, Brother Wolfgang wrote this letter to his friend back in uh, Munich, 30 feet long, 20 feet wide, two stories high, made only of logs and mud. We still have quite a way to go to finish it. And so they left Indian Bush 150 years ago, but where was it? This is one of my favorite things to investigate, and I've been bugging my people like my father-in-law, who, who's, you know, Roski's name, is. they've been in Collegeville forever, um, to try to figure this out, because all I had was, you know, this vague idea that it's someplace down in Lower Collegeville, which is where we live. So to give, give you some of those clues, um, as I said before, Prior Othmar built the monastery in the college, the buildings of which not a trace remain, were well, about half a mile west of what is now the Collegeville Station on the railroad line, which is now the Wobegon Trail. Okay, stay with me here. So most of the land of the immediate vicinity had been claimed, but there were still tracks, and they talk about the monks claiming the acres of land north of St. Joseph, 14 miles west of St. Cloud. A handwritten document in the archives, which you can't read here, but I've translated below. The fathers secured land at and near the present site of Collegeville, 12 miles west of St. Cloud. So is it 12 miles west of St. Cloud, or is it 14 miles west of St. Cloud? Well, it's like trying to say, well, are you, you know, it's 10 miles to St. Cloud if you're going to Crossroads, but it's 12 if you're going to the courthouse, you know, that sort of thing. So there's a little give and take there in the measurements. Another quote from the same document, several lay brothers, um, I covered up my own words there, let's see, um, were set to work clearing the land and a small monastery was built about one quarter of a mile west of Collegeville Station. Okay, one quarter of a mile, all right. Benedict the prior chose the site in which the monastery stood, although there's some accounts that say Bruno actually chose it, I don't know. Anyway, so it was section 31 of the township of St. Wendell, also called St. Wendell with two L's and an A on the maps. 
Um, so this is a later map, but to show you where Section 31 is, it's right there. And this is an even later map, but it shows more clearly where Section 31 is in relation to Lake Sagatag and, and the railroad and the other features. So there's Section 31, and there's a close-up of it. So in Section 31 and 32, in the southwest corner of St. Wendell Township, just north of the present township of Collegeville, which then didn't exist. Collegeville Township was created by taking part of St. Joe Township and part of Avon Township. Um, so that's the vicinity that we're talking about. And Worship and Works says that they built this 20 by 30 log house outside of St. Joseph. And with the help of farmers, they broke and cultivated Indian bush in section 31. Okay, note the footnote. I love footnotes. We'll follow that footnote up in a little bit. So the third transfer was made, and they resumed work in the heart of Indian Bush, a short distance from the present station. There's no railway line, so the railroad's on this map, but it wasn't there at the time. Father Benedict caused a house to be built, too small for the community, and a more pretentious frame building, also a neat little chapel had been built. So you can see the little chapel drawn on the back there. That's important. Um, the exact spot cannot be easily verified, for there's no chart showing its location, but it was about one furlong, parentheses, see chart by me, 1939. Dang, we could not find that reference. <laughs> David looked for it in the Abbey archives. I looked in the university archives. I don't know what that chart, circa 1939, showed. But he says, southwest from Collegeville Railroad Station, in a line drawn from that point southwest to the old Himsel home on the road to Avon. Okay, so let's follow that one up. So there's a circle around where the Collegeville Station was and a circle where the Himsel place was. And if you draw a line from them, between them, it's not southwest. <laughs> It's not southwest. It's, if anything, it's northwest, or it's at least more due west. So, wrong reference? Who knows? Also, one furlong. So that red circle shows about one furlong long. So it's, presumably it's somewhere on that radius. Okay. St. John's in the Indian bush. Here's footnote number seven. This log structure was to serve as a center for the farming enterprise prior Benedict began. The old farm was located a short distance northwest of the present Collegeville rail, rail, Railroad Station in the Watab Meadow. Northwest? That was not something that fit, even though the other line showed it going northwest. Uh, why would they have built on the other side of the river? Uh, that was not in any of the references. So I think that was a typo in worship and work. And David agreed with me when I first asked him about this. So we think it was supposed to be southwest. Okay. Here's a little drawing of the chapel inset there. Um, during the winter of that year, 150 years ago, a primitive road was cut through the forest to the old farm, to the, from the old farm to the new building site, i.e. where we are now. And so that April of 1866, um, they began cutting down the trees because it was all treed um, where they were going to build their buildings. And so the frame house was moved up from the College of a Farm to serve as lodging for the laborers. So that's that little frame house with the chapel attached to it. It was picked up and moved. This picture I just put up is in Worship and Work, and it's labeled as the Collegeville Station House. Well, that's just a block from where I live, and I've taken pictures of it. Christina Torino and her family, her kids live there now. It's not the same house. <laughs> it's not the Collegeville Station. It's, it's the old... Um, frame house. And I found other pictures to back that up. So in January 1883, when the old college buildings burned down, again, this is another reference to that fire, um, it was a matter for regret that the landmark disappeared, leaving not a trace of buildings. Okay, so no trace of buildings. Another footnote. Great. Footnote number 70. So if we look at the aerial view of the land, and we've got this footnote from the 54 Scriptorium article. It says, Father Roman, who had been here on, the, came to the campus two years after that fire, had taken Father Pascal Boltz and some other brothers down there and 
there was no sign of the fire anymore, but he pointed out where it was. So that's as close as we could come. And he says, and it was after the fire, so he came in 1885, it was approximately 1,000 feet southwest of the Diekman house. Um, Marie Diekman was the postmistress, so she was living in the station house. Um, and 350 feet west of the present Collegeville Road. Okay, you with me so far? So we have all these differing, differing uh, versions of where it actually was. So one source says half a mile west of what's now the station. Another one says a quarter, quarter of a mile west of the Collegeville station a furlong southwest from the station, or 1,000 feet southwest and 350 feet. Okay, every year, every year that uh, Jean Levine teaches the GIS class for the environmental studies students, she puts out word that they're looking for projects, and so I asked her if she, one of her students would do a project and map those for me. So they got out there, she got, the student got out her GIS uh, device, and the points on this map represent the half a mile west, the fourth of a mile west, the eighth of a mile west, and the 1,000 feet southwest, 350 feet west. And the little railroad symbol there marks where the house is, the station house, the Collegeville Station, AKA the post office, um, now on the Wobegon Trail. Okay, remember the part about the frame house was moved up, taken apart and transported to the new site. And then the old buildings were destroyed by fire. Okay, so if we take the measurement that actually gives us, you know, actual measurements, 1,000 feet and 350 feet, there's the Diekman house. 1,000 feet southwest would put it along this line, this red line. 350 feet west of the road puts it along that line. So one can say, aha, that's where Indian Bush was. But I'm not done yet. I gave a <laughs> I gave a presentation about this to uh, our parish, a little history of the parish, um, when we celebrated our 140th a, a short time back, and I was talking about this and showing this to our parishioners, and he's not here tonight. But Bill Cofell, who's a longtime member, a valued member, Michael refers to him sometimes as the mayor of Collegeville. Um, Bill talked about the nails that he had found in his garden. They have rented a piece of land from the abbey for years and years and years and had a garden down there, right there. And Bill found the nails. He said, I have a whole bucket of them at home. I said, oh, this would be so cool. So he brought me, and I keep them in this, <laughs> I found this wonderful royal-looking uh, wine bottle gift bag <laughs> seems appropriate somehow um, and so he gave me these nails and they are hand fashioned by a blacksmith back in the day and they were in that space in that garden dug up over time by Bill and his family doing garden work I think these are the real thing and I think they confirm that that's where your first place was, guys, you, the monks. That's where, you, that's where they first settled, down in Indian Bush, 400 feet from our house. <laughs> They're here for anybody who wants to examine them. I'm still waiting for, for Bill to find a bucket. Because <laughs> I think it might be have potential as fundraiser for St. John's. <laughs> Okay, so that's where I think Indian Bush really was. This is another old map, a hand-drawn map based on the 1874 census, and it shows Collegeville as a little village down there on the railroad tracks. Um, and here's a, the 1874 official atlas that shows uh, St. John's College with the roads kind of haphazardly drawn in there, not necessarily to scale, I would guess. Um, the 1896 plat map, which is here, here, there you see section 31 and 32, and Lake St. Louis, and that's um, what they called the Lake Sagatagan at first, because they were honoring Ludwig, 
who, and, and to my knowledge, that was the first time that they named something after a big donor, and the last time they did until the Warner Palestra was dedicated yeah. in 1973. All the times in between, they used the names of saints or previous monks or other things to name the buildings after until they started <laughs> relying more on donors to have names on buildings. So St. Louis on the Lake, here's a, another early sketch, um, shows the stone house and the frame house. How am I doing for time? Oh, I'm past time, aren't I? Sh should I stop now or shall I? <laughs> okay, just a few more. Um, so here's the, that house and here's a, a floor plan, again drawn by Alexius Hoffman, that shows the chapel on the bottom and the carpenter shop and so on and the little trails that go to the stone house. So you can see there's the frame house and there's the stone house and the path that went between them. And there's the, the other drawing that shows the chapel with its roof out behind the building. Here's that building, which I think we've already determined. And here's that floor plan. But if you look at the building and the floor plan, something struck me wrong until I turned it around and put the chapel on the back side. So this would be the face, the, this side of the building would be toward the west, and the stone house is in the right relative position. In Worship and Work, he cut out the stone house. He just shows this and identifies it as the post office. And so I, it's like, no, that's not right. It was right there by the stone house until you edited out the other building. Um, and then there's this other picture, another one that I just got from David in the archives that showed the frame house, 1866 to 1886, like this. Well, this was disorienting to me. I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I looked at it, because when I look at this drawing and the other picture, it seems like the chapel should be on the other side. And so I flipped the picture, and then it made sense. So the chapel and the little lean to on the side of it, which, you know, and they'd come out of that and go to the stone house. It made more sense to me if you flip the picture around. It's not the first time that I've discovered a picture needed to be flipped to make sense. There's an early picture of Flintown that didn't make sense until I flipped it around. And then it, the barn was in the right place and so on. So um, the stone house was occupied. The frame house, which used to be in Collegeville, was taken apart and brought up to campus. And it was nothing but an ordinary, humble residence like thousands of others in the vicinity. And just to close up, here's a picture of St. John's that shows the stone house and the frame house still there before they were taken down. And to compare it, here's St. Vincent's. See the similarity? And then an aerial shot of Monte Cassino. Not quite the same, but lots of quadrangles and a history there. And here's the plat book that shows Collegeville having streets down there by the railroad tracks. And you see these in old plat books, but it never says anything about them. But it's 1896 plat book shows up. Then there's a sketch that, again, was in the Abbey archives that showed the street names and the plots. So again, they were going to sell plots uh, down in Lower Collegeville. It was going to be a boom town, you know? And I, you can tell this is an old drawing because he's got the post office in its very first original site. It was on the other side of the tracks. It wasn't too long after that that they moved it to the opposite corner. Um, so I know this is an old drawing. Um, but you see Alexis Street, St. John Street, College Avenue, and Benedict Street drawn in on the map. 1925, it's still there. And in fact, 2006, when they first started doing GIS maps on the internet, these streets still showed up as being in Lower Collegeville. <laughs> Alexia Street, St. John Street, and St. Benedict Street were there on Google Earth. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'm so glad I saved that image, because of course now you don't see that. They corrected themselves after a while. But MapQuest and Google Earth and, and the others were, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> they have these streets there that don't exist. But at one time, they were planned, so they were in the old plat books. And so there they are, Alexia Street, St. John Street, St. Benedict Street. College Avenue, or College Street in the middle, um, you know, when they came through and said they had to give us addresses, Route 2, St. Joe didn't work anymore, they were going to call it Nutmeg Road. And we had a little neighborhood meeting, I think it was at our house, with all the local college villains, and we met in, and uh, Bill Cofell suggested naming it Bro Broker Street. Um, 
but we ended up calling it Old Collegeville Road in a little bit of a tizzy because the township had called the frontage road Collegeville Road, and that was new. That didn't have any rights to be called Collegeville Road because it was our road that led to Collegeville before they put the footbridge in, or the freeway through. Anyway, that's the present view from the air, and I'm done. And thank you for your patience and attention. He asked what year the railroad came through. I should have this community. I, I think it was 1879 when it finally started stopping in Collegeville. It was put through earlier, but the monks still had to travel to at least St. Joe to get goods and people. It was. Yeah. I, I, Working for the railroad? Uh, on the railroad, uh, it was already built, of course, but the uh, wooden trestle was in all those low spots mm -hmm. for the drive. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they got paid a dollar a day to, to unload dirt off those flat cars uh, to cover up and, and to fill in sure. and, and then put the railroad on a higher plane. I know. I've always been amazed, even just going on them now as, as trails, to think, oh, the work that must have gone into creating these. Annette, did you want to add something? Actually, both of those dates are right, because the tracks were built, right. and then the railroad went back then. Mm. And, and there, is, there is a nice historical marker down by what used to be the train stop in Collegeville. Uh, it documents that, and it says 18, I'm pretty sure that's where the 1879 comes from. That's when they finally had their own stop in Collegeville. Anybody else? With the 1918 flu epidemic have any impact on the development of the school? Um, I, don't, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure it did. I know there were students who passed away from the epidemic. Um, it's interesting to go to the the cemetery too and see you know not just Ruth Rothkopf but the first um, there I, there's a, I could tell you another history lesson but I don't have time about the first cemetery and how they moved it and where it was and the first students that were moved from there to the permanent cemetery now Hillary. I think, I think that was the case, in a, in a post office, a station in a post office, and then it saved Brother Thaddeus from taking his uh, wagon all the way into St. Joe and before that into St. Cloud to fetch people and postage uh, um, packages and, and that sort of thing, yeah. And Alexius might have had some, well, I mean, they might have had some pull with his connections in St. Cloud, and then the brokers became the first postal 
service providers down in Collegeville. And of course, Henry Broker was a brother-in-law to Alexius Elderbrock, I think, wasn't it? Catherine Broker. And there's a connection there. I'm not remembering the details necessarily. Anybody else? How did that affect us here? They fled. I mean, basically, they they fled into St. Joe. They built a stockade in St. Joe, which is uh, where the memorial park is in St. Joe. It's got a memorial marker, a historical marker. And it talks about the stockade that was built there to hide out from the Indian uprising. But they didn't actually uprise quote unquote, here. I mean, nobody around here got killed, but everybody fled and took cover during the Indian uprising. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. Yeah, and uh, of course down on to Mankato. Wilfred. Where did the Huns get the money to buy the land? <laughs> <laughs> You had to ask that, huh? <laughs> oh. Well, they got some of it, well, they got a lot of it from King Ludwig, indirectly or directly, depending on which story you want to hear. Oh. But he paid them back. I mean, I mean, they, he, they paid back the sisters from whom they absconded temporarily with some of the funds, but they more than made it up later. But yeah, you got to read about Benedict or Eve to get that whole story. <laughs> Okay, anybody else? I've, I've kept you past time. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.